Family, I come before you today with what I feel is a very important message. I'm going to begin this video with touching on two things in the news that are very relevant to this topic. The first instance is the death of a 23-year-old named Karen Gaines. She's been, her story been in the news a lot today in regards to how police came to arrest her because of some traffic violations. And it ultimately ended in an eight hour standoff from what I hear and her life ending with the police fatally shooting her and injuring her five year old son. Another incident involved a 24 year old woman named Joyce Kiewet. She was brutally tortured and murdered by her, what I believe is her husband, who was an ex-police officer at Temple University, along with his friend, who's currently, or was up until this incident, was a police officer at Temple University. These two men, and I used to designation men very loosely, came together, tortured her, beat her with their hands in police baton, all because she was not submitting to her husband's authority. Now, these two tragedies have something in common. The, the thing that they have in common is not the police, or at least that's not what I'm highlighting. It's not the police ending their lives and involves something else. I will get on what this common thing is momentarily. Because trust me, it ties into what I'm about to talk about. Now, just like George Kiway was under attack, the black church is under attack. But the sad thing is the black church doesn't realize, or at least a large segment does not realize, because it's too busy minding the business of the white church and trying to emulate it. And because of this following suit and uh, trying to mimic or emulate the white church like it's the, the epitome of Christian maturity, which it is not, actually it's the opposite. But because of the black church paying closely, close attention to the white church, it's missing, it's not even recognizing that it's being attacked not by Islam, as the white church make us try to make the church biggest enemy along with them. The black church didn't do anything to Islam. That's the white church in this mess. The black church is being attacked by the very people that it's supposed to be ministering to. Let me explain what I mean by this. Both Karen Gaines and George Kiewe, the thing that they have in common is that they both was associated with what people can commonly call conscious black organizations or members of the conscious community. Now, many of you out there know I already know what the country's community is. And I don't have the time to go into the great detail what it is, but essentially I can say this. You can say the country's community is a series of groups or organizations or ideologies that was developed because of the black church was not doing its job. 
These black country groups consist of groups like the NOI, also known as the Nation of Islam, the Black Hebrew Israelites, the Morris Science Temple, the Comedic Scientists, and what is known, commonly known as the Five Percenters, or the Nation of the Gods and Earths, or the Five Percent Nation. Majority of these organizations was developed and came about because of white supremacy or racism. Because the, the church in general, not just the black church, but the black and white church together, they failed at their job of doing what it can to fight against racism. It failed at highlighting racism as the greatest sin uh, that, uh, that is in existence today. It is the greatest weapon thus far that Satan has created. It failed pointing this out. In many respects, the white church benefits from white supremacy or racism. It keeps them in power. So naturally, they're not gonna be going out of this way to end something that helps maintain them have a comfortable life. And thus, the black church should be working towards fighting against white supremacy and ministering to black people in general. But like I said, it's too busy minding the white church running behind it. And thus, these black conscious organizations that was developed because of the black church falling asleep at its post. It was developed because of that inactivity. And now they're attacking the church and they're drawing away members. The church, the black church is feeling great casualties. It's drawing away many members and these organizations are growing at a rapid pace, especially the black Hebrew Israelites. A majority of its members is former members of the black church. So how does this relate? Like I said, Karen Gaines of George Kirway was associated with two of these groups, conscious groups. Karen Gaines was associated with a known as the Morris, uh, Morris Science Temple, or uh, the ideology that the more communicate, especially in particular, something known as sovereign citizenship and in essence is basically the idea that black people can file certain paperwork and that it will qualify them as a sovereign citizen that means that they are autonomous uh, from the u.s laws in many respects so once they file this supposed paperwork, as many things that they feel that they can do, then in actuality is illegal. And sadly, Karen Gaines got caught up in this mentality. And those familiar with the story know she behaved in a manner that many found odd, but it coincides with their Moore's science ideology. She felt, like I said, many of the laws of these United States did not apply to her. Or that because of her status, as it were, all she had to do was bring to their attention a number of things. And this would magically make them leave her alone. Foolishly, <laughs> she thought that. I just laugh now, now because her death was fun. But just the whole concept of being communicated is very foolish. Now, in the case of George Kiway, she and her husband and his friend was associated with the Black Hebrew Israelites, or just Hebrew Israelites. And basically, for those who are not familiar with them, they are a group 
that runs around that feels that all the original Israelites was black, which I tend to agree with. But where we part in our understanding is that they argue that Deuteronomy 28 was the prophecy that foretold the enslavement of black people, excuse me, the enslavement of Africans be carried to the U.S. on the transatlantic slave trade. Thus, depending on who you speak to, which group you speak to, because even though they're called the black Hebrew Israelites or the Hebrew Israelites, they have what they call camps which is the equivalent to the denominations you see in Christianity, institutional Christianity, I'll put it that way. So according to them, like I said, depending on which camp you speak to, they will either say that all of the descendants of the slaves brought to the Americas during the transatlantic slave trade, or during chattel slavery, are descendants of the original Israelites spoken of in scripture. Others would tell you that no, it's just certain ones that are here in present. The descendants of those, some of those Africans that are translated slave trade are really Israel. Then there's a, the others within it would say not just blacks here in the US, in Car the Caribbean, but you have Hispanics and Native Americans and other groups that are really Israel. Now, with that said, how this came into play with your skew way is that they hold heavily to the Old Testament. If anything they have in common is that they believe that they all are true Israel, and they believe heavily in the Old Testament. The Old Testament trumps other things, even those amongst them that believe in the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't hold as much weight to them as the Old. So in trying to emulate the things they see in the Old Testament, in the case of George Q. A., for some strange, odd reason, her husband and his friend felt that as he being the husband and she did not submit some type of way, he looked in the Old Testament and came up with the idea that he had a right to beat her. I, I read the Bible, the whole Bible a number of times. I don't recall running into anything saying that. I know it asks why I should submit, but I don't recall anything in there stating that a man has a right to beat his wife to death if she does not submit to his authority. So these conscious groups are very dangerous in what they teach. But it all comes from the lack of concern by the black church. These people daily are leaving Christianity and going to these organizations because they're tired of racism, they're tired of, the, of white supremacy, they're tired of the black church just thinking of ways to enrich certain members of it. Or on the other end, they're too busy running behind the white church, specifically running behind white reformed Christians. It's some within the black church that would eat up anything that a white reformed Christian would tell them. They would listen to no one else except people like John MacArthur, Paul Washer, John Piper, and the list goes on. They can't think for themselves. They have to follow behind these old white guys, essentially. And because of that, and that tending to the hurting members of the black church needs, they're losing them left and right, and they're running out there. These, these people, these, these lost sheep, these hurt sheep running out there, getting caught up with these, these wolves, and getting 
injured and killed in the process. So, because of this, BC Media will do whatever it can to equip black Christians with the knowledge of these groups, how to defend from their attacks, but also how to attack them in return and show or demonstrate the truthfulness of Christianity. It would also be effective what BC is gonna to try to do in helping evangelism helping the black church evangelistic efforts, which is supposed to be doing. Because even if someone's not a believer, the information that BC Media is going to try to disseminate will be beneficial for all. And if members of the black church is doing what it's supposed to do and evangelize, then they have information that they can pass on to help those out there that's not even a part of the church because after all, we're supposed to love God and our neighbor. And so our neighbor, not just those that are just interested in our message or coming to church with us or what have you. So what am I talking about? I said all of that for what? Well, what BC Media is going to do is, the first thing we're going to do in this area we're going to create a show called Black Urban Apologetics. Now, some of you familiar with the name Apologetics, but why Black and Urban? Well, some of you also may be familiar with the, the name Urban Apologetics. But, and I'm going to touch on what all of this means momentarily. But we're qualifying our brand of apologetics as black urban apologetics. Why? Because when you look at generally look at apologetics or urban apologetics, the majority is forwarded by reformed white guys, if they even, you know, for the ones that even have a mind to think of. And even when it's not white, the individuals forwarding this movement or this ministry or whatever you want to call it. Even if they're not white, they're blacks or Hispanics or what have you, that are reformed. So, so it's just like the white guys are leading it because all of these people run right behind, like I said earlier. It's not just the black churches all over, Asian, Hispanic or whatever, large segment runs behind the white church because they think the white church is the model of Christian maturity, which is not. And it teaches a very dangerous form of theology called reform theology. This stuff will be covered on some of the other shows that be easy off. But back to my point. So it's called Black Urban Apologetics because it's focused entirely on black people. It educates the black church in areas that they have to deal with. For example, while textual criticism is, is important in, in, in you know, demonstrating that the Bible is reliable, but it's not every day that this issue comes up. Big Mama at the church, she's not thinking about textual criticism because to her, The Bible is the inspired, infallible word of God. That's not a question for her. But what Big Mama may have to come across is any one of her grandchildren or even great-grandchildren coming to her and asking her why are black people in the state that they're in. Coming to her asking her, is Christianity a white man's religion? Coming to her, asking her, if that's the case, why all the pictures, uh, why that picture on the wall of Jesus is white? See, those are the type of questions that black people have to deal with. 
Now, the white church will have you thinking that apologetics is involves all what they deem is important or have to deal with, and that's wrong. Because I know many black Christians that have come against these very same black conscious groups and they ask them some things in relation to the church and race and history that stumbled them. That they asked questions that was very hard to answer. Why? Because the black church are too concerned with running behind the white church and what it deems is important than to stop and deal with the issues at home. So, I already explained why it's called black, because it's focused on the black church, it's focused on black people and it's me. But I'm, what I'm gonna spend some time doing now, explaining apologetics, what it is exactly. Because that's a new word perhaps to some people and they think I'm trying to get the black church to go and apologize for things. Now, don't get me wrong, it needs to apologize for a lot. But the word apologetics does not have anything to do with apologizing or an apology in the sense that we think of coming. So what is apologetics? Apologetics simply is the defense of the Christian faith. It is the word apologetics is derived from a Greek word, and that Greek word is apologia. Basically, apologia meant a defense in a judicial context. Basically, if an accusation was made to some made against someone, the defendant or the person that the accusation was made against will get an opportunity to refute the charges in their defense, which was called an apologia. Basically, the defendant would literally speak away the accusation. Apologia is comprised of the prefix and the suffix. Apo, which means away, and logia means speech. So they would literally speak away the accusation. Someone would make an accusation against somebody, they will get a chance to present an apology or they'll get a chance to speak away the accusation. They will say, no, this does not apply because of X, Y, and Z, thus making the accusation go away. Now, how does this come into play within the Christian context? Well, I'm going to go to a couple of texts of scripture. We're going to start with 1 Peter. We're going to go to 1 Peter. We're going to look at the third chapter in verse 15. It says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Now, the word there where it says, where it says to make a defense, the word for defense is, is derived from apologia. So basically what Peter is saying here, let's look at it in context. Uh, verse 14, he says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear the intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Verse 16, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. So basically what Peter is saying here is that as a Christian, you may have to face criticism, you may have to face slander. But he's saying in the midst of all this, you ought to maintain a good conscience, which is found in having good conduct, you know, before those that are criticizing and slandering you. And he said to make a defense. And I quote exactly, he says, to make a defense 
to everyone who asks you to give an account of the hope that is in you. So basically he's saying when, some, when they're in the midst of all this slander criticism, you know, this persecution, and they maintain it a good conscience before God by being obedient to him and by uh, doing good things as it were. Those that are criticized slander are going to see this, even though all of this is happening. They have not done anything negative towards, you know, me, if I was the one criticizing slander. And they will say, well, why is this? I've done this, that, and the other to you, or they done this, that, and the other to you. You have not done anything in return. You have maintained good conduct before us all, even though we have done bad or they have done bad. Why is that? Why do you behave this way? And so Peter would say, well, what you do is you give them an answer. You give them apology. So we say, okay, well, this is why we maintain good behavior and give them that reason. Then it's like, okay, you made these accusations against us, you slandered us or whatever. So well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to speak away to slandering this accusation. You say we did that and the other. Well, this is not true because of X, Y, and Z. Boom, took it away. You slander us in this area, that's not true because of X, Y, Z, boom, you took it away. That's what Peter's saying here. He's saying to give an apology, to speak away the accusation, speak away the slander. And while doing so, you tell them why you reacted in the way that you did as a Christian. That's basically what Peter saying here. And another uh, passage that we're going to look at is the Philippians, the first chapter. Philippians, the first chapter, and we're going to look at verses 1, excuse me, the first chapter, we're going to look at verses 7 and then 16. Verse 7 says, for, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you all. Because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. And then in verse 16, he says, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Both of those instances, once again, terms derived from apology. So Paul put apologia in the context of being associated with the gospel. So even in declaring the gospel, wherever you may define that to be, that's a whole other discussion. In delivering the gospel, you may have to engage in apologia because when you communicate that message to someone, that person may in turn may come with accusations, slander that they may have heard from others, or maybe some bad experience or what have you, they went through and they will bring those things up while you're communicating the gospel. So you have to defend the gospel. And by extension, what Peter said, I hope or what have you, they have you out there declaring the gospel, proclaiming the gospel with an apology. So, that's basically in those passages. But before I close out, I, I want to touch a little bit more on this matter. Now, like I said, in, in the context of scripture, it was just basically a, a defense. It was basically apologia, was like I said, speaking away the accusations, speaking away the slander, and brought against Christians, or brought against Christianity. But now when you look at apologetics, you have all these apologetic ministries out there, white ministries out there. You have uh, the Christian Research Institute with Hank Hennigraf, the so-called Bible Answer Man. You have uh, Ravi Zacharias. He's Indian, but you know he follows behind, so I don't have to go through that again. Um, who else is out there? Um, there's There's other apologetic ministries out there currently majority like i said ran by whites reform whites uh, and they they take apologetics to a level where they're delving into science and, and and 
all of these other subtopics of study, and it's very systematic and very formulated, you know, we see today, whereas originally apologetics or apology was simply responding or defending the Christian faith, you know, within the context of Christianity. I mean, it was used, like I said, in Athens, for instance, you know, it was a courtroom procedure. It was much of what we see today. Someone make an accusation, you get an opportunity to defend yourself in some form or fashion. But the reason why things became a lot more technical in nature when it came to apologetics, this simple, you know, response or defense was following the first century, during the early since second, third centuries, and so forth, the early centuries of Christianity, many Christians or professed Christians had to deal with a lot more complicated arguments, accusations, you know, philosoph uh, philosophies, and so forth. So the first detail um, intellectual apologist is found in the first century. He, we were, he wasn't the first, but he's one of the most popular or well known. He wasn't the first, but he was one of the first. And this person's name was Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr wrote something called the first apology. And in it, basically, he defended the morality of the Christian faith. And he tried and he provided different arguments to try to convince the Roman Emperor Antonius to stop persecuting Christians. Why were they persecuted? Why was the accusations piling up? Why was the slander piling up? Well, to answer that, you have to understand the nature of the context of the environment that they was in. See, because of Christians' fidelity to their God, Yah, and to their Lord Jesus, it put them in some dicey situation or a dicey predicament because you got to understand during these early centuries, the cult of emperor of worship came into play. And because of this, the emperor and the state demanded loyalty. They demanded that Christians make an oath because what the emperor cult worship was, or the cult of emperor worship, it believed that the Caesar or the head of the Roman state was deity that Caesar was a god amongst the other gods of the Roman pantheon. And because of this, everyone within the jurisdiction of Rome was demanded to give an oath. And that oath was Kaiser Curios, which literally means Caesar is Lord. Now, mind you, as Paul told them and Peter told Christian, I just read part of Peter's uh, admonition in 1 Peter 3.15, where Christians are to maintain a good conscience, they are to display good behavior, they are to pay their taxes, you know, obey the civil authorities to the extent that it doesn't violate any of God's law. And Christians did that. They were some of the most well-behaved people in the entire Roman Empire. But, see, there was a big problem. I told you, it was that oath that they had to make where they called, where they declared that Caesar is Lord. And also, from a religious context, Christians, well, I, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. I'll get to that momentary, what I'm about to say. So, just leading with the whole oath thing, the Kaiser Curios, or Caesar is Lord, they were asked to say that, and the Christians said no. Because their oath was Aesus ho Kyrios, which meant Jesus is Lord in Greek. Rome didn't like that. And because of that, Rome saw them as enemies of the state, but it was more to this. There was three charges brought against them. 
that was the first charge. They was accused of being of sedition, of being enemies of the state because they wouldn't declare Caesar as being Lord. The second charge that was brought against them was for atheism. Now you might ask, okay, they just they would declare Jesus as curios. Excuse me, Jesus or curios. Jesus is Lord. From an orthodox perspective, Jesus is God. We already know that they worship God the Father, Jehovah. So how in the world can anyone accuse Christians of being atheists? Well, this is how atheism, the word atheism originally came about. See, atheism involved whether you believe in the state, the state sanctioned gods. See, Rome had their pantheon. The Roman gods, which they borrowed from Greeks and others, but everyone should be familiar with the Roman gods. So within the context of the Roman Empire, you can have your religion. You can believe just about anything you want, as long as you made room for the Roman gods, which includes Caesar. You can worship whoever you like, but at a certain point, you had to make that oath, and you had to worship the Roman gods, do something to demonstrate that you recognize the Roman gods, because in Roman thinking, these gods was the one that maintained the kingdom, that upheld the kingdom. And so it was disrespectful. It was traitorous not to worship or recognize the ones that held, in their opinion, the empire together, the one that made the empire prosperous, etc. So because Christians did not do this, they did not worship these gods, did not recognize Caesar as Lord. They was charged as being atheists. Now the third charge, and it's the final charge, before I close out, that I'm going to cover, final thing I'm going to cover, is cannibalism. Now this, this essentially was from a misunderstanding of the Lord's Supper. See, what, what was going on here was, like I said, they were being persecuted, they were being slandered, they were being criticized. I went through the first two charges that was brought against them. So they had essentially, in many respects, hide their worship. It wasn't popular to come out and say you're a Christian like it is nowadays. So they had to sneak off in certain places to observe the Lord's Supper and to worship together, um, if you want to call it that. I say they came together to edify each other. That's a whole other conversation and difference in there. But anyway, they had to sneak off and do this thing under the cover of darkness. You know, at night, they had to go in the woods, they had to go in caves. Rome had underground catacombs where the dead was buried, basically underground graveyards. So they had to sneak down there just to come together, to gather together for edification. And they observed the Lord's Supper. And so people, even though in light of all this was going on, they still managed to evangelize. So people would hear and pick up things regarding the Lord's Supper and the teaching of Christ. The teachings that Jesus communicated that his apostles taught the later generations and so forth. And part of that was when Jesus spoke about drinking his blood and eating his flesh, which we know to be symbolic. Moving forward, when we observe the Lord's Supper, the wine represents his blood and the broken bread represents his broken body. And so non-believers took that literally, that Christians were literally drinking, sneaking off to drink human blood and to eat human flesh. So the Christians were accused of being cannibals. So I just gave you this little brief background in history on apologetics. And so those are the type of things that early Christians had to face. Early Christians had to develop more sound, fleshed out arguments and defenses for their belief. Well, 
the black church has to adapt to its situation, the situation that is that it created and develop defenses and arguments, you know, fortify itself from these attacks and be able to counterattack and hopefully prevent more vulnerable black Christians from leaving and hopefully bring many that went out there and joined these conscious organizations back in. So with that said, I'm proud to introduce that in the very near future, BC Media will have a show entitled Black Urban Apologetics. And we hope that it's beneficial to all, and we hope that everyone learns from it and will become equipped to defend against these attacks that are brought against the Black church. So I want to tell them, family, Black Christian power. With two of these groups, conscious groups. Karen Gaines was associated with a known as the Morris, uh, Morris Science Temple, uh, the ideology that the more communicate. Especially in particular, something known as sovereign citizenship. And in essence, it's basically the idea that. Black people can file certain paperwork and that it will qualify them as a sovereign citizen. That means that they are autonomous uh, from the U.S. laws in many respects. So once they file this supposed paperwork, as many things that they feel that they can do, then in actuality is illegal. And sadly, Karen Gaines got caught up in this mentality. And those familiar with the story know she behaved in a manner that many found odd, but it coincides with that Moorish science ideology. She felt, like I said, many of the laws of these United States did not apply to her, or that because of her status as it were. All she had to do was bring to their attention a number of things. And this would magically make them leave her alone. Foolishly, <laughs> she thought that. I just laugh now, now because her death was fun. But just the whole concept of being communicated very foolish. Now, in the case of George Kiway, she and her husband and his friend was associated with the Black Hebrew Israelites, or just Hebrew Israelites. And basically, for those who are not familiar with them, they are a group that runs around that feels that all the original Israelites was Black, which I tend to agree with. But where we part in our understanding is that they argue that Deuteronomy 28 was the prophecy that foretold the enslavement of black people, excuse me, the enslavement of Africans, be carried to the U.S. on the transatlantic slave trade. Thus, depending on who you speak to, which group you speak to, because even though they're called the black Hebrew Israelites or the Hebrew Israelites, they have what they call camps which is the equivalent to the denominations you see in Christianity, institutional Christianity, I'll put it that way. So according to them, like I said, depending on which camp you speak to, they will either say that all of the descendants of the slaves brought to the Americas during the transatlantic slave trade, or during chattel slavery, are descendants of the original Israelites spoken of in scripture. Others would tell you that no, it's just certain ones that are here in present. The descendants of those, some of those Africans that are translated slave trade are really Israel. Then there's a, 
and others within it would say not just blacks here in the U.S., in Car the Caribbean, but you have Hispanics and Native Americans and other groups that are really Israel. Now, with that said, how this came into play with your skew way is that they hold heavily to the Old Testament. If anything they have in common is that they believe that they all are true Israel and they believe heavily in the Old Testament. The Old Testament trumps other things, even those amongst them that believe in the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't hold as much weight to them as the Old. So in trying to emulate the things they see in the Old Testament, in the case of George Q. A., for some strange, odd reason, her husband and his friend The black church is under attack. But the sad thing is the black church doesn't realize, or at least a large segment does not realize, because it's too busy minding the business of the white church and trying to emulate it. And because of this following suit and uh, trying to mimic or emulate the white church like it's the, the epitome of Christian maturity, which it is not, actually it's the opposite. But because of the black church paying closely, close attention to the white church, it's missing, it's not even recognizing that it's being attacked not by Islam, as the white church make us try to make the church biggest enemy along with them. The black church didn't do anything to Islam. That's the white church in this mess. The black church is being attacked by the very people that it's supposed to be ministering to. Let me explain what I mean by this. Both Karen Gaines and George Kuway, the thing that they have in common is that they both was associated with what people can commonly call conscious black organizations or members of the conscious community. Now, many of you out there know I already know what the country's community is. And I don't have the time to go into great detail what it is, but essentially I can say this. You can say the country's community is a series of groups or organizations or ideologies that was developed because of the black church was not doing its job. These black countries groups consist of groups like the NOI, family, I come before you today with what I feel is a very important message. I'm going to begin this video with touching on two things in the news that are very relevant to this topic. The first instance is the death of a 23-year-old named Karen Gaines. She's been, her story been in the news a lot today in regards to how police came to arrest her because of some traffic violations. And it ultimately ended in an eight-hour standoff, from what I hear, and her life ending with the police fatally shooting her and injuring a five-year-old son. Another incident involved a 24-year-old woman named George Kiwe. She was brutally tortured and murdered by her, what I believe is her husband, who was an ex 
police officer at Temple University, along with his friend, who's currently, or was up until this incident, was a police officer at Temple University. These two men, and I used the designation men very loosely, came together, tortured her, beat her with their hands in police baton, all because she was not submitting to a husband's authority. Now, these two tragedies have something in common. The, the thing that they have in common is not the police, or at least that's not what I'm highlighting. It's not the police ending their lives. It involves something else. I will get on what this common thing is momentarily. Because trust me, it ties into what I'm about to talk about. Now, just like George Kiway was under attack, also known as the Nation of Islam, the Black Hebrew Israelites, the Morris Science Temple, the Comedic Scientists, and what is known, commonly known as the Five Percenters, are the Nation of the Gods and Earths, or the Five Percent Nation. Majority of these organizations was developed and came about because of white supremacy or racism. Because the, the church in general, not just the black church, but the black and white church together, they failed at their job of doing what it can to fight against racism. It failed at highlighting racism as the greatest sin that uh, that is in existence today. It is the greatest weapon thus far that Satan has created. It failed pointing this out. In many respects, the white church benefits from white supremacy or racism. It keeps them in power. So naturally, they're not going to be going out of this way to end something that helps maintain them have a comfortable life. And thus, the black church should be working towards fighting against white supremacy and minister, ministering to black people in general. But like I said, it's too busy minding the white church running behind it. And thus, these black conscious organizations that was developed because of the black church falling asleep at its post. It was developed because of that inactivity. And now they're attacking the church and they're drawing away members. The church, the black church is still in great casualties. It's drawing away many members and these organizations are growing at a rapid pace, especially the black Hebrew Israelites. And majority of its members it's former members of the black church. So how does this relate? Like I said, Karen Gaines of George Kirway was associated 